Uh, good afternoon, everyone. If you're welcome back into your seats. Can everyone just make sure their phones are on silent, please, before we start this um, last panel session of today? Um, I am joined by three uh, very, uh, very elite experts in foreign policy um, to talk about how the British diplomacy machine is going to be able to deal with the threats and the challenges that have been discussed during the course of the day. Is the diplomatic machinery uh, that we currently have, the structures, are they sufficient to be able to forge Britain's new role in the world after Brexit? Um, and how are we going to manage? So um, I will introduce uh, the panel. Um, I'm going to start from right to left, only because that's how I've written their names down. Um, so first of all, we've got over here um, Professor Christopher Hill, who has been with Cambridge University. He joined um, the university in 2004 um, at the Department of Politics and International Studies. Uh, and he's also, uh, previously to that, spent about three or four decades at the London School of Economics. Um, a lifetime. <laughs> and uh, he's apparently retired in 2016, but still um, very much active at the university and also publishing lots of books. The most relevant one for today's discussion being one from last year, which is entitled The Future of British Foreign Policy, Security and Diplomacy in a World After Brexit. So you must have been pretty confident that Brexit was going to happen. I wasn't, no. <laughs> <but>. <laughs> um, so uh, we're going to be hearing from uh, Professor Hill and uh, also to my left, uh, sorry, right, right. sorry, <laughs> sorry, a bit nervous. No, no. Um, mm -hmm. Sean McLeod, who is uh, ambassador to the Republic of Serbia. Um, she is a, a career diplomat, joined the Foreign Office back in 1986, speaks Russian. Her first posting was to Moscow, uh, where a place that she returned to between 2004 and 2007, which must have been a particularly interesting time given the demise of, of um, Alexander Litvinenko uh, back in the UK. Um, she, before the post uh, to the Republic of Serbia, she was the ambassador and the head of the UK delegation to the Organisation for Security and Cooperation in Europe, so very well versed in the security threats and challenges facing the continent. And then last but not least, to my left, um, we have Mena Rawlings, who is currently the Director General, Economic and Global Issues, and I had to look that up on the Foreign Office website to see what it means, and it means that she has responsibility, forget this, Global Britain, and not just that, also the Asia-Pacific, Americas, Africa, Overseas Territories, Commonwealth, and economic diplomacy. And as well as that, she's a champion of diversity and inclusion. So I'm very impressed that she's here with us, given that <laughs> massive <exhausted>, workload. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're going to start off with um, our three panellists giving their thoughts on our, um, on our uh, topic of discussion, and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience and hopefully wrap it up within the next hour. So we're going to start from my left and then my right. Um, and um, yeah, so over to you, Mena. Great, thank you very much, Deborah, and it's great to be here. Good afternoon, everybody. So uh, I'm going to try and give an overview, and then I think Sean will probably tell it a bit more how it feels on the front line of diplomacy. Um, but just to sort of kick things off, I was uh, reflecting, I suppose, on the premise for this panel today, uh, which is that we're putting British diplomacy to the test. I think that presumes what I'm sure you've been hearing uh, about a lot so far uh, during uh, this conference today, which is about effectively the age of disruption and some of the threats that that creates uh, for diplomacy, but also for Britain in the world more generally. And you know, I was just reflecting that if you were thinking about you know, five of the sort of mega challenges, I guess, facing the world today, and thus the UK, you might think about the big five, as I put it. I've had two postings in Africa, so I always you know, have a safari reference in there somewhere. Uh, but my big five would be climate, the growth of China, and as part of that, the shift of power, global power, east and south. Uh, technology, the rise of technology. Uh, fourthly, demography, the uh, sharp increase in the world's population and some of the pressures uh, that puts on our planet. 
So uh, from 7.7 .7 billion people today to an expected 9.7 billion by 2050. And then the fifth one I'd call something like citizen's voice or populism or the rise of inequality, uh, whatever you want to use to describe, I think, some of the domestic challenges that we've been seeing in the UK and in many other liberal Western democracies as well. Um, but I'm sure you've heard a lot about the challenges, but I wanted to focus a bit more on the opportunities that that presents to us as British diplomats out there in the world. Um, and in thinking about this, I was thinking about a song by Ian Jury and the Blockheads, which some of the people in the room might be old enough to remember, Reasons to be Cheerful, Part 3. Um, so here's my Part 3, Reasons to be Cheerful, when it comes to putting diplomacy to the test. First of all, um, I would say that uh, leaving the European Union is the equivalent of a kick up the diplomatic backside, is how I would express it. Uh, and what uh, my, foreign my foreign secretary, Dominic Raab, would probably say, I don't think he'd say quite that, but he'd say that it's a, it's a once in a gener generation opportunity to really reinvigorate the, Brit the British position, the UK's position on the world stage. And I think we're going to see a lot on that over the coming weeks, and I won't preempt it, but as I'm sure you've discussed, we've got the integrated review coming up, which, as the Prime Minister has said, will reassess the nation's place in the world, covering all aspects of international policy from defence to diplomacy to development. I think that is a real opportunity to step back, to look at the world as it is in 2020, where we want to be in five years' time, and to think about how to connect all the dots, what sort of posture do we want to take, what sort of issues do we really want to engage in amongst those global challenges that I've set out. So that's the first um, reason to be cheerful. Second one is that I think this is built on strong foundations. Um, and I think we do have a tendency sometimes in this country to talk ourselves down. Um, but if you're thinking about diplomacy, I would think not about the D of diplomacy, but also D for defence and D for development, um, where, as is well known, I'm sure you've heard it today as well, we spend 2% of um, our GDP on defence and 0.7% of GNI on development spending. And we're one of the very few nations in the world to actually do that. So we do put our money where our mouth is as a nation. And then on diplomacy, again, we hear a lot about you know, the decline of British diplomacy. But I would remind you that actually in the last couple of years, we've been putting new investment into our diplomatic network, which I think is coming good now. It's increasing our resources around the world. We're opening 12 new missions. I think we've already opened 10 uh, with two more to come. We have 1,000 new staff out there in the network and we're the world's third largest diplomatic network after China and the US. Um, size does count for something, but also the quality and the capability, I think, of our diplomatic resources are something that I see every day and I'm very proud of. Um, I think the other thing I'd mention in this context is soft power. Uh, we are a soft power superpower. And at this point, I have to quote from Love Actually in that great Hugh Grant quote when he's being Prime Minister and he says, we may be a small country but we're a great one too. The country of Shakespeare, Churchill, the Beatles, Sean Connery, Harry Potter, David Beckham's right foot, David Beckham's left foot, come to that. Um, and as a British diplomat, I'd add to Hugh Grant's list the British Council, um, our leadership on climate change, uh, which obviously we're hoping to see through with a successful COP summit at the end of this year in Glasgow. Uh, the UK's cut carbon emissions faster than any other G20 country. Um, and you know, that's one of the many things I could talk about that puts us right at the top of the soft power list. Slightly annoyingly, second to France this year, um, but given some of the bumps and turmoils of the last few months, I don't think that's a bad place to be. And I think for me, soft power helps us to influence on really tough issues, such as ending sexual violence in conflict or promoting media freedom. And it's an antidote, I would argue, to the deployment of sharp or coercive power by some of our competitors because it celebrates and projects the fruits of freedom. It showcases innovation, diverse and multicultural societies, and a willingness to take risks and try new things. So all of those things, and I could talk about many others, I think are in our sort of diplomatic toolbox and will help us as we embark on a new phase in our history. And then the third reason to be cheerful, therefore, is that I would say that Global Britain is more than a slogan. Uh, since I've taken on this job, I've heard a lot of critiquing of Global Britain. Are we really that? Do we really mean it? Um, can we be that way as Empire 2.0? 
and all of that, I would say, well, yes, we can, and no, it isn't. Um, and what Global Britain about, in essence, is three things. First of all, leaving the EU, you might have noticed, uh, but also building new friendships and alliances with EU countries and indeed with a range of other countries around the world to help navigate these global challenges that we face. Uh, it also means reasserting ourselves as a liberal and free trading nation, taking up an independent seat at the WTO and through a very ambitious program of negotiating new free trade agreements, not just with the EU, but with many other partners as well, really sort of uh, finding our way again in the world in the pursuit of free and liberal trading arrangements for all. And then finally, and then I'll stop for now, uh, I think we have a strong moral anchor to our foreign policy, as Dominic Raab would put it. And, you know, we are a force for good in the world. And that might sound slightly arrogant, but we know from surveys, we know from a recent survey by Populous, that is how most other nations do see the UK. And they see our ability to play a catalytic role as a force for good uh, around this globe as a positive thing about Britain and British diplomacy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so fascinating insight from right at the heart of the Foreign Office and from the woman in charge of Global Britain. Um, so maybe now for a more specific look at what it's like on the front line of um, Britain's diplomatic missions. Um, over to you. Thanks so much, Deborah. Good afternoon, everybody. And um, for anybody who's lived in Serbia or elsewhere in the Western Balkans, you won't be surprised when I say that to add to Mena's list of uh, things, I've also learnt that we are also very importantly the country of only fools and horses. I had to do some homework on that when I arrived. <laughs> um, so, British diplomacy put to the test. Put to the test. Uh, anybody who's a colleague or former colleague of Mena and I sitting in the room will know that diplomacy is rarely a job for the faint-hearted. And resilience, indeed, is a mandatory core skill for all our senior UK diplomats. We all have stories. Um, you've heard that I served in Moscow. I served there twice. So my stories about dramas and crises include the collapse of the Soviet Union, 9-11, the illegal annexation of Crimea, and um, the ratification of the Lisbon Treaty that some of you may remember. Also proved quite a drama. I think what's different with current circumstances, though, is the personal impact of the referendum, the domestic uncertainty that we've just been through, and some changes in the way that we, we're going to be doing some of our business. But we are resilient, and we're also very adaptable. So I'd like, by way of introduction, to make three observations. Um, Firstly, on perspectives, I think given the title of the session this afternoon, it's worth remembering that things will look different and may look different depending on where you're sitting within our diplomatic network. And if you're sitting in uh, an EU post as ambassador, you'll have, some, you'll have more practical issues to address and more new facets to your relationships, which of course may already be very close bilateral relationships that you need to address um, compared to colleagues who are sitting on the other side of the world. Um, my own vantage point is a particularly interesting one because I'm working in a region where we continue to support vital reforms that are in fact largely different, driven by the EU aspirations of host governments. Um, but picking up on what Mena said, of course, the big global challenges we're all focused on and dealing with. My second observation would be on adaptability. I think it's probably fair to say that British diplomats love challenges. We're creative, we're resourceful, and we love creating opportunities. So I think what you will be seeing around the world is diplomats right across the FCO network acting with total professionalism and adapting and operating very creatively doing diplomacy differently, if you like. This time last year, as a, I was a multilateral ambassador. I was the head of the United Kingdom's delegation to the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, in Vienna. That meant that I was spending three or four weeks 
three or four hours, sorry, every week in meetings with other EU heads of mission, alone, meetings of EU heads of mission. Every member of my delegation was spending several hours a week in meetings with EU colleagues. I'm not saying that was not time well spent. In fact, we were extremely effective and influential in those discussions. But looking to the future, my successor and his delegation and the United Kingdom in those organisations, we're going to have more freedom about what we say, how we say it and when we say it. And my successor, Neil Bush, can choose how he's going to spend those extra three or four hours a week. Uh, thirdly, capability and resource. That's something that Men has already touched on. Um, of course, you know, we, we now do have new circumstances. We do need to focus on our national profile. And in some places, yes, we need to raise our level of ambition. And we're doing that now in Serbia and across our increasingly dynamic Western Balkan network of embassies. Uh, we need the right people, we need the right skills, and we need the right resources to, to fulfill our, our, you know, our goals and our ambitions. I've been in Belgrade for five months. I say that as a caveat, because I don't, I know I've got a lot to learn still. But after five months, I would say that um, although not all the resource I have is where I need it, for example, I would very much like to have more trade and investment capacity in the Western Balkans. I'm sure colleagues in DIT are listening. Um, but overall, I would say that my embassy has grown in the last year or two to pretty much the right size and shape for what we want to do. Um, we're going to be extremely busy. It's going to be hard work. And we are going to need strong political engagement in support of our diplomatic investment. But we have huge potential. So I'm very optimistic. I mean, men, as reasons to be cheerful, I'm actually very optimistic about the opportunities we have in the Western Balkans. Um, and I happen to be lucky that I'm also in a country where my host government is also very optimistic about the chance to build a stronger, forward-looking relationship. So finally, um, a, a few words about the bigger diplomatic picture for me sitting as part of that global UK network that, that Men has talked about. What matters to me as a diplomat representing the UK is the sort of country I represent. What matters is how I project that country, how I help protect it, and how, what I can do to enhance the prosperity of the United Kingdom. And also, what matters to me is our contribution to the global community. So as long as we're promoting and defending democratic values, as long as we're upholding and promoting a healthy international rules-based order, as long as we are building the relationships and the cooperation that we need to tackle climate change and other global challenges, then as British diplomats, I believe we can meet the test. Thank you. Thank you ever so much for that um, really interesting insight from the front line of um, British <coughs> diplomacy. Um, and now, last but not least, uh, we're going to hear from Professor Hill, who can maybe give your thoughts from outside the Foreign Office on the challenges for British diplomacy. Yes, indeed. Thank you very much to Rusi and to the UK in Changing Europe for the invitation. I I dare say people have said already what a great job the uh, Menon and his colleagues have done in uh, uh, increasing the un uh, amount of under public understanding and information during the last few years. Um, I've learned a lot today from my colleagues who've talked a very good game, I think. I've learned a lot from diplomats in general over the years. I have the advantage, obviously, of being an academic and can say more or less what I like. Although when you're, in, I'm retired as well, which is even better, because when you're in post, you're vulnerable to the accusation from some that you might have retired but not told your bosses. Um, whereas at least now nobody accuses me of working, as it were. I'm not expected to. Anyway, let me get down to, get down to the point. Um, 
As, as I think um, uh, Mena and Sean have both said, diplomacy is always a test, actually. Uh, it's a difficult profession, and I lay on one side the physical dangers which shouldn't be underestimated for our diplomats. But it is actually a difficult job intellectually, practically, personally, demanding. And we now are in uh, a very important historical juncture. I was sorry to miss Laurie Friedman's talk this morning, and I gather that he talked about the continuity of the Anglo-American political relationship, which I think is certainly true. But equally, from 1968 to 1975, we went through quite a significant change in terms of the decision to devalue the... 67, actually, the decision to devalue the pound, the withdrawal from east of Suez, and, of course, the last of the three applications to the EU, which led to the successful... Uh, application and uh, acceptance and to the referendum 1975. So while that was not a break with the United States, it was some kind of statement that Britain felt itself to be more a regional than a global power in the future. And now we're going in the other direction after a period of nearly 50 years. And it remains to be seen how that's going to work out. It's certainly not going to be easy. It's going to be very challenging for the individuals concerned. And the individuals concerned are not just the professional diplomats that we've heard from today, although they're certainly in the front line in every respect. Diplomacy is going to be required of our politicians as well. And as we well know, some of our politicians are not noted for their skills in that respect. Uh, so uh, I hope that when cabinet reshuffles take place, uh, there will be the ability to consider the need, the need for uh, the people who give instructions to uh, our diplomats actually to make sense of the challenges and tasks and the parameters of what they're doing uh, from the very top level. And of course, even if we're talking about officials, we're also talking about officials in other departments because it's well known that foreign policy has not simply been uh, the task of foreign ministries over the last 40 years, perhaps never. We've got defence diplomacy, we've got DFID and, and so on. Um, uh, and we're actually in a period when there might be some institutional upheaval as well. We're certainly thinking of questions of institutional design in foreign policy making the talk about DFID coming or development coming back under the Foreign Office's uh, wing, the strengthening of the merging of number 10 and the Cabinet Office, the concentration of, of even greater concentration of, uh, of policy making at that uh, central level. And we've seen, seen it over, over many years from Thatcher and Blair uh, onwards. So all that is up in the air quite apart from the question of Mr. Cummings and the SPADs and what kind of influence they are going to uh, exert or want to exert or be able to exert over foreign policy. I mean, no individual, however uh, Rasputin-like, can, can have their uh, uh, hands in every possible till, at least not without making some very serious blunders. Somebody said in the previous session, and in a way, uh, the idea of security which was discussed there is, a, is the bridging concept between discussion of defence and the discussion of foreign policy, uh, because both uh, uh, the Ministry of Defence and the Foreign Office are concerned about security and, and have been for many years, and indeed the Organisation of Security and Cooperation in Europe was one of the first things that we got involved in uh, the process of European cooperation at the Helsinki Accords in '75. And on whether it's on security or more narrow issues of foreign policy, we are, as somebody said in that last session, going to have to concentrate on bilaterals. And indeed, that the kind of ideology of bilateralism has been given a boost uh, in, in the last uh, year or two. And those bilaterals are going to have to take place both within the EU, because we're going to have to upgrade our bilateral relations with the member states, the 27. Uh, we're not going to be uh, have access to the Coru network and all the economies of scale that did take place, whatever you think of the common foreign security policy, it certainly had a, a network of procedures which made life easier for diplomats in all the capitals. So we're going to have to resuscitate the bilateral structures uh, there. And also globally, of course, we're going to have to think about what 
new friends and partners we're going to be seeking and try to upgrade the resources. And it was very interesting to hear that the, the, the embassy in Belgrade has already been upgraded. Of course, that's presumably with thinking about possible future enlargement of the EU in mind, but there will be embassies further afield which have to be uh, upgraded as well. And since 1989, although there has, as men have said, been uh, a, a, a desperate attempt really to get people in back into the system uh, to do diplomacy over the last few years. The secular trend since 1989 has been one of cuts to the diplomatic establishment, and uh, uh, partly because the EU has provided certain procedural economies of scale, um, but also partly because it's an easy target, um, even though it doesn't cost much, as we know, in terms of public expenditure. So now we're going to have to decide where we prioritise uh, in terms of which bilateral relationships we think are key. At the same time, we can't do without multilateralism. At least, uh, I'm assuming that the present government doesn't want to follow the Trump playbook in this particular respect of rubbishing multilateralism as a phenomenon. Um, I don't think the Americans seriously believe they can do without multilateralism either, but uh, they're not, uh, the, pre the president is not keen on the very concept. We certainly, I don't think, uh, uh, I'd be amazed if any of the professionals uh, think that multilateralism is something which Britain cannot take seriously any longer. We must be aware of the uh, weakened position in the UN as a result of the failure to get our, our, our uh, judge onto the world court, defeats over the Chagos Chagossians and so on. Um, and, of course, uh, we are not any longer going to have any capacity to speak for Europe in the wider sense in the Security Council. Not that we actually did technically, because under the Treaty of Maastricht uh, and Lisbon we made it absolutely clear that we were members of the Security Council first and, and not to speak for the European Union in there, but still there's a blurring of the lines there. So we have to think about multilateralism, UN, Commonwealth, and NATO, of course, as is going to be not much will change on, on that front, the NATO front. I expect it'll be beefed up even further, but NATO is not a foreign policy-making forum, primarily. Um, and uh, I'm being ordered to wrap up, so I will. I will say that, uh, if I may, we'll have 30 seconds or so left, um, that my basic uh, if I had to have a single strap line to my argument, it would be that we are doomed to continue to collaborate with our uh, geographical neighbours, the EU member states, and not just the EU member states, but other European countries. We're going to be outside the rooms. So that's going to be much more difficult. There are going to be costs of time and, and money and diplomatic energy and so on. But apart from anything else, the way the EU evolves, whether it goes down or whether it goes up, is a vital interest for the UK, which we cannot ignore. Uh, we're not going to be able to influence so easily the enlargement process on which we've been a key player uh, over the years, for, bit, for good or ill. And so we're going to have to consider uh, what is going to be the biggest challenge for our diplomacy, in a way, is how we continue to influence the EU and its member states, but from a different starting uh, position. And lastly, I think, unfortunately, uh, per contra to what Mena said about our soft power and force for good and all the rest of it, uh, I think Brexit has caused us very significant reputational damage in the world. I think our soft power is, uh, will recover, and there are plenty of important parts of it, even if David Beckham has retired. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, we need to get over the damage that's been done to the image of our institutions, even the, uh, the rule of law in our country. And of course, we still have people, our own citizens, who don't think that we're a force for good and uh, seem willing to uh, attack us in the streets. And these things have to be taken into account in the overall uh, uh, panoply of dipl diplomatic activity. Thank you very much. So, um, uh, really interesting interventions. I, I particularly liked Mena's expression about how leaving the EU is a kick up the <laughs> diplomatic backside. Um, I hope you don't mind if I take opportunity of being the chair to ask the first question and then I'll obviously open it up to everybody else. Um, I was at a speech last week by Penny Mordaunt who was quite critical of the Foreign Office saying that it didn't have any, it didn't have a particular strategy um, and she also talked about how um, the, you know, the need, and you kind of touched on it when you talked about defence diplomacy and development together being needed to help pack a punch. Are the structures currently in place 
fit for purpose. Obviously, now's the time, this big review's coming up. What changes are going to need to be made to ensure that Britain, no longer with the ability to amplify our, our priorities through the EU mechanism, is going to be able to ensure that as a permanent member of the Security Council, as a leading member of NATO, as a significant power, that our voice is still heard, for, heard and listened to? Great, thank you. Shall I go first? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for the question. Um, I should say, by the way, I forgot to say this at the start, that uh, Professor Hill was one of my lecturers when I studied international relations at the London School of Economics uh, over 30 years ago. So, so I guess what goes around comes around, <laughs> Professor. Uh, but it's great to see you again. Um, uh, so sorry, to get to your, to get, get to your, your question. I mean... You know, first of all, I think I'm not going to pretend that we haven't had quite a challenging couple of years in terms of diplomatic strategy because at the end of the day, a lot of this is down to political leadership. Um, and I think that given some of the, the, the challenges within our sort of parliamentary democracy over the last two years, uh, the, the sort of... You know, the, the sort of follow-up to the referendum, the doubt about when we were going to leave, all that sort of stuff. I mean, that inevitably does play through uh, to the extent to which we're able to conduct a sort of, you know, holistic, totally coherent diplomatic strategy in all corners of the world. Uh, but that said, and, you know, not trying to blow our own trumpet, but I think we did a pretty good job in the circumstances. And if you look at some of the things that happened during that period, let's take, for example, uh, the, the chemical weapons attack on the streets of Salisbury. Actually, the British diplomatic reaction to that was incredibly strong and I think showed that we can still uh, convene and cohere a global diplomatic response to a threat on British soil, not just a threat, um, an attack on British soil. So, so I wouldn't be too negative with all respect to... Well, we were still EU members then, so we had that benefit. Yeah, that is true. But, I mean, we also managed to get several countries outside the EU on our side. I mean, I was in Australia at the time, and Australia, uh, for example, also expelled a couple of Russian diplomats at that time. So, you know, it was a much wider effect than that. And I think my point would be that, you know, there's a lot of global architecture. Yes, the EU is a really important part of that, and so we're going to have to work our way in the world without pursuing doing so many of our interests through the EU, but actually we've got a lot of global connections. We belong to the key multilateral organisations that you've mentioned, G7, G20, NATO, um, OECD, Commonwealth, etc., etc. So I think, you know, we are able still to conduct uh, diplomacy through bilateral means, but also multilateral. Um, very briefly in terms of you know, the sort of the structure at home more, I suppose. I mean, first of all, obviously there are discussions going on and I don't know what's going to happen in the reshuffle or indeed any potential machinery of government changes. I genuinely don't know, but let's see how that comes out. But I think certainly from this government, we are seeing a real uh, push for us to work even more closely together. I'm sure you've heard of the fusion strategy uh, that's driving closer collaboration and closer working across Whitehall, pulling us out of our departmental silos into a more sort of integrated approach across the national security community. And personally, I think that's the way to go. Um, partly because, as you said, or somebody said, you know, diplomacy, I think it was Christopher actually, diplomacy isn't just a matter for foreign ministries anymore. It has to involve a much, much wide, wider range of actors inside government, but also outside as well. And our ability to cohere with that group, I think, is as important as our ability to make connections around the world. Thank you. Do you want to... Add anything? Or? Yeah, Which order are you going in? I don't, well, I don't mind. If... Oh, shall I just think then you can add something expert? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> you um, know what it's like I'll, at well, the front line. I'll, well, I'll, I'll follow, follow what Mena says. I mean, just one brief comment. I think I Professor Friedman said this morning, and I think <laughs> Professor Hill, in the introduction to your book, you also talk about. Um, a tendency of many countries to exaggerate their own importance. But I think Mena's right. I think we shouldn't also shouldn't underestimate. Um, <laughs> you know, the role we can play and how we are seen elsewhere in the world. Um, and we do have a, a huge amount to offer. Um, and the fact that we have a long, a large, strong diplomatic network is a reflection of that. Um, as far as machinery of government is concerned, of course, that's, and you know, how you, how you cut the governmental cake and organise it, organize it that, that's going to be a matter for the government. But, but I would say, maybe following what Mena says, already in my embassy I have many parts of government working uh, under one roof. And, and you know, it's absolutely 
really high priority for us to make sure that we are all working together as one team, however the departmental structures are organised at home. We're all you know, following the same business plan and same strategy. Um, on the question of strategy and whether the FCO needs a strategy, I think, um, I think the good thing now is that um, it's, it's, we've now got an opportunity to look forward and um, whatever anybody thought in 2016, whatever happened, you know, we're now all looking forward and focused on what, where we go now and what, what happens next. And, and you know, I'm sure the government will be, be setting clear priorities. Obviously, the transition period for EU is a very, the EU exit is a very high priority, but I think what's a really good sign is that that's not the only priority on the government agenda. And I think, climate change and the fact that we'll be focusing so much on COP26 and, and what we can do, um, how we can contribute to that, I think is, is a really good thing. And um, yeah, we're going to be looking to the future and uh, look forward to seeing if there's any, I mean, I don't know if there's going to be any change in machinery of government or not, or, or, but I think uh, in, in, in terms of strategy, it's about look at, looking to the future, making clear what our priorities are. Let me, uh, I'll try and answer the question directly by saying three things. The first is the easiest. I think we need to upgrade diplomacy. I'm sure my colleagues will agree. We need to rehabilitate the idea of diplomacy as not something which is kind of uh, rather weak and inadequate and, uh, you know, doesn't stack up uh, because, you know, in Mrs. Thatcher's apparent old, old line, you know, the diplomat is re really represents the foreigner rather than her home society. So we've got to upgrade diplomacy and resources and ideas. We, go, we need these people. Secondly, we've got to accept that modern uh, global politics is about the interaction between the domestic and the external, more or less all the time, and in different degrees, in different contexts. But nonetheless, you can't abstract international relations and foreign policy from what's going on at home. And that was exactly the point made by Sean when she said, it's about what kind of country I'm there to represent. She, you know, a diplomat who gets out of touch with the kind of country that's at home um, and doesn't come home enough, maybe, um, will find their job much more uh, difficult. But the third is, uh, is a more, it, it, uh, perhaps more controversial point of my own, which is that not only we do, do we need to make uh, some priorities, but we need to have what I would call a, a, a kind of new realism, and, that, and it would build on, in a way, Lord Houghton's remarks in the earlier sessions. You know, we cannot any longer deal in these metaphors of three circles, a bridge between Europe and America, a pivot, a hub power or whatever. You know, it doesn't make any actual practical sense. And with all, all due apologies also to MENA, I don't think Global Britain does either. We've got to concentrate a bit more on the nuts and bolts of all this. Um, and in that, in particularly, I think, uh, we've got to think about the relationship between trade and foreign policy a bit more explicitly, um, as Huawei, uh, uh, is the issue has, has brought up. If we have got to find new trade partners, and that is going to lead our conception of what we do in the world, that is going to have some implications for our policies on human rights, on strategic posture, and all the rest of it. Uh, my own uh, bias, if you want to, want to call it that, is that it would be stupid to throw away uh, the 40 or 50 years of working habits with our European partners, just as it would be stupid to throw away the accumulated successes and institutions of NATO. They're there, they're not to ossify what we do, they're to give us capabilities. But it's going to be a major challenge for diplomacy, both to get keep those things in play while our erstwhile partners may not uh, take the same view of us as they used to and we'll be outside the legal framework but also bringing coming back to the domestic external point to do it without having a reaction at home which says you're betraying brexit you know we don't want anything to do with europe and, and in other words getting the tabloids on your back so that is in itself a political challenge of diplomacy as well as a technical technical one for colleagues like uh, sean amena Thank you very much. So now open up to questions. You've got 20 minutes. Um, the gentleman here with the yellow tie caught my eye first. And then after that, the gentleman there. But maybe just Thank you. Uh, Keith Best, Secretary of the European Movement in the, the UK. Uh, both the calibre but also the quantity of diplomats are going to be crucial for us. And I want to just uh, ask a question about that. 
First of all, apart from the fact that we're going to need an army of new people to mirror the regulations in Europe to see whether we want to diverge from them or, or, or not, and that's going to require a massive recruitment drive unless I've got that entirely wrong, uh, the, there's a question of how we staff our embassies abroad. We, for a start, we're going to have to staff 27 new embassies uh, straight away with a, a, a whole load of high-caliber people in, in Europe. But I want to ask, ask about Africa, a developing continent, we've heard about that earlier, uh, very, very important. I am told that the French knock spots off us in their embassies, particularly in Francophonie, but, but also elsewhere. They have so many trade councillors going out there and doing business with African entrepreneurs and such like, and sometimes we have only two or three people. Uh, we are losing out, Sorry, from can my you keep understanding. The question yeah. quite short. So can I just ask you know, what, what the reaction is to that? Okay. Who would like to take that? Maybe Mina? Yeah. Um, so I can have first go at that very quickly. I mean, I think... So Africa, I've served twice in Africa, in Ghana and in Kenya. I was there last week, or was it the week before? It's all a blur. Um, I was in South Africa, sort of following up, following our African Investment Summit two weeks ago. Um, and this isn't a direct answer to your question, but I think it is worth remembering the very close relationships we do have with countries across Africa, particularly in Anglophone Africa. And I agree we've got more to do, actually, in Francophone and Lusophone Africa. Um, you know, we have relied quite a lot on the Commonwealth. I think we need to branch out. But the African Investment Summit shows that we do still have that convening power and that we can, in the UK, create new partnerships with African countries built not on the past but on the future, including our offer on investment and on tech uh, and on on helping with, for example, the adaptation away from coal into new technologies. So for me, it's not just about the people on the ground and the numbers, and if the French have got more in Africa, well, you know, good for them. But I think it is about our capabilities and um, the sort of offer that, that we bring alongside some of, the, some of the more soft power stuff, you know, the culture, the rule of law, the legal systems, language, etc. cetera. But I'm, that's not to say I'm complacent. Um, and we are, as part of our global uplift, putting more staff into Africa more posts as well. Thank you. So if we can just keep the questions short, and I think... Just one word. You, can I just one word on the... the um, just, um, if I may, um, I don't think it's the case that we need 27 new embassies in the European Union. I and mean, we have... You know, very, very well staffed embassies, some of them very large within the European Union. When I was ambassador to Prague, in Prague, I had um, 60 people working my embassy. I think those embassies have probably been reinforced with some more diplomatic staff, but I mean, it's, it's certainly the case that we already have substantial embassies across the European Union. So, like the gentleman, sorry, I, just, I think we haven't got much time, so if you, the gentleman in the fourth row there. If you can just ask, ask a short question, because we don't have too much time. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Martin Hatfield, I'm a former diplomat and colleague of Menace and Chance. Um, on soft power, I entirely agree with everything Menace said, but it's also a question of how other people see you and your, uh, uh, how, how you can therefore influence them. Uh, I think a lot of uh, countries, certainly where I've served, have had respect for uh, the integrity of our diplomacy, and I don't mean that in a po-face way, I don't mean uh, um, the going back to a Robin Cook um, human rights-based diplomacy, but actually particularly evidence-based foreign policy. Um, and I had personal experience, for example, of um, the, uh, our consular advice after the Fukushima earthquake, in uh, Fukushima nuclear incident in Japan, uh, or on uh, climate change policy. So we, we will stand behind evidence-based foreign policy making. How are we going to ensure that that is protected in an increasingly uh, challenging environment, both domestically and internationally? Who would like to know that one? Do you want to go first? I want to go first. Do you want no, to no, 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 not on that. <coughs> I'm not sure I quite understand the question, if I'm really honest. Evidence, how we can make sure that our policy, foreign policy making is evidence-based, is that the... So Martin, are, is that the... We are uh, advocating Okay. Okay. So, well, I think that's the the. I mean, that's the 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 sort of policy making role or policy advice role of 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 officials, isn't it? And and, and diplomats and and um, of course, you know, ministers are going to be taking decisions on 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 policies. But I would always hope that the 
the case that's being put to them is evidence-based. I mean, I would certainly always make any submission I was writing or any advice I was making to ministers evidence-based. I'm not aware of any reason to, to think that that's that there's any reason for thinking that would change. I think on, um, you mentioned scientific stuff, of course. I mean, the Foreign Office now has a scientific, a scientific advisor and a team to make sure that we have got that expertise in-house. Um, and it's, 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 there's been a recent debate about, about whether officials have enough scientific uh, knowledge. And I was struck by that because... Because I have to say, as a diplomat, it comes from a scientific family, but I'm, as a diplomat, I've, I've learned a fascinating amount of science as I go through my job, because whether I've dealt with trade work that's to do with advanced lasers or science work that's to do with plasma physics or, or something, or, or even to do with nerve agents, or, or you know, I've, I've actually learned a lot of science in my job, but I wouldn't be the person to provide the hard evidence. That's why we have to look for expertise, but... Just to add to that, I mean, I wonder if Martin's suggesting we're sort of going to international relations by assertion rather than, uh. than by evidence base. And, and I mean, just to back in what Sean's said, I think there is actually, including with this new government, a lot of, um, a lot of attachment actually to evidence based policy making. And in the Foreign Office, if anything, you know, we're trying to up our game on this and understand much more about the opportunities that we get from understanding big data. Uh, and how to become better, actually, not just at the words of diplomacy, but also using data to drive more of our policy making. And as Sean says, all we can do is advise, but actually the market, the political market for that, I'm finding is pretty strong. And, um, Jonathan, you look keen to ask a question. Jonathan Isle from here, from the Institute. If I may, a question to Mina on, on, on a pure practical basis. Whatever we think of Brexit, the coverage in most of the world's media has been that Britain will be a weaker country as a result of that, whether, whether we agree with it or not. Um, apart from saying, no, 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 you got it all wrong, what is it that we can do to try to deflect this image, which is patently there in all the coverage around the world, that we are the demandeur in any negotiations on trade, that we are the smaller of all the parts, and that we've sort of shot ourselves in the foot. Again, uh, making abstraction of whether it was right or wrong, that it was a political decision, but we are where we are. And to Sean, just a tiny question, how are we able, since you are where you're serving now, how are we able to say to lots of countries in Southeast Europe and around the Black Sea area that it's in their interest to join the European Union while we've decided it's not in ours? Two great questions. So I'm quite glad Sean's got the second question. I'll leave her with that one. I mean, I think, you know, first of all, going back to Martin's point, what's the evidence? And how do we know that all countries around the world are seeing us as weaker as a result? And actually, the polling evidence is not that clear. So I referred briefly back to a survey that we've done through Populous of, I think, 33,000 people around the world in, I can't remember the exact number of countries, but it's, I think it's about 33. Um, which actually shows that outside of Europe, that is not the perception. And in fact, perceptions of global Britain, okay, at quite a sort of macro level, have actually gone up over the last um, year or so. Um, and it's partly because, you know, Brexit is huge to us, and we talk about it all the time. It is much less visible or relevant to large swathes of people in other parts of the world, unless they're particularly closely associated with, you know, the European Union or international policy. And, you know, I was in Australia for four years uh, until last February. And yes, there were very mixed views because people are very close to our political system and very interested in our domestic politics. But it's absolutely not the case that there is a set view one way or the other. Different people have different views, often mirroring where they sit in the political spectrum compared to their counterparts in the UK. Um, and in other countries, so for example in Southeast Asia, you know, my counterparts there were always telling me that Brexit barely came up in the conversation. And actually there's an appetite to see Britain, you know, as a new dialogue partner of ASEAN nations or, you know, re-engaging East of Suez. Uh, and I think there the challenge is, is more one will have to deal with an integrated review, which is the sort of ambition versus resources and how much more do we want to do and can we do. But, you know, I just don't think it's that um, binary. Sure. Okay, so... Um, I mean, any country has to take its own decisions on what is best for it, for its security, its 
stability, its regional stability, for its prosperity. And the country I'm serving in and countries in the region have, have, have decided that they're formally that their policy should be that they want to, to accede to the European Union and they're at different stages in, in that process. Um, that's their decision and that's, that's, that's what they consider to be right for their countries and, and it's, it's, you know, we're, the decision has been taken by our government here what is considered right for our country. So I don't think there's an incompatibility there. I think what um, the other point I would make, though, is that, as I said earlier, um, that process of aspiring to accede to and going through the accession process of the European Union does entail a lot of reforms. And those reforms self-evidently are good for the countries. They're good for regional stability, they're good for, 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 for domestic, um, domestic reasons and, and so on. So we, we will carry on, absolutely, we will carry on supporting that. And, you know, the, the headline is, we're still part of the same continent. We're, you know, we're leaving the European Union. We're not leaving Europe. Um, the stability and security of, of the Western Balkans or Southeast Europe still matters to us as much whether we're in the EU or, or not in the EU. Um, and just on the other, kind of, if I may, just, um, I just think that, yes, of course, an important part of what I'm doing and what we're all doing around the global network is, is going to be about shaping that profile and that, that image of the UK in the future. And, you know, I hope that's going to be built around our strengths because we've got a lot of them. So time is running short, but there are three questions. If we take the three the gentleman at the back, the gentleman there with the maroon-coloured tie, and the gentleman there who's been very patiently waiting, um, and then if you maybe can choose who wants to answer one of each questions. And then if there's any more time, we'll have some more. Thanks. So, I'm Daniel Wincott. I work at Cardiff University. I'm also a research director of UK and Changing Europe. I run a programme of ESRC's funded research um, this morning there was a, a, a statement made that the changing should be fr in front of the UK rather than the Europe. And Tom Tugendhat used the code these islands to describe the place from which he was speaking. Uh, I wonder what you think the impact on uh, British soft power will be of uh, a potential drawn out conflict between the government here and the government in Scotland about the possibility of independence or about the uh, Northern Ireland uh, leaving the UK and joining the EU. If we go on historical precedent... Sorry, can, we, can I cut you short? Yeah. We, get the, okay. we get the gist. Uh, yeah. uh, I'm General Salgado, uh, Spanish Army in the NATO headquarters in, in Gloucester. And uh, I am ask, I, my question is uh, uh, coming from a Spaniard as a citizen living here more than a general in the army. So... Uh, I think whether the, the, your natural, the UK natural partner are European Union countries, normal, due to historical and uh, natural and proximity. So you, you have a natural relationship with us. Um, but uh, uh, I think uh, if I put an example of uh, the, sorry, the, sorry, could you yeah, just ask the question, please? Yeah, yeah. The, the, the question is very simple, because there are many uh, British people living in Spain, 400,000 uh, British people, 80 million tourists every year, and we have a very close relationship. Yeah. Uh, probably more than... So the question is, what is the message you send to the Spanish government about the diplomacy, um, and what is the benefit... Uh, the, the Spanish can, or the British people living in Spain can expect. Okay, thank you. That, and okay? gentlemen there, if you could just pass the microphone along, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Stephen Andrews, uh, security sector reform background, anything else would take a bit longer. Um, Please be brief. <laughs> yes. Uh, 1998, we've touched on this morning as being uh, the last quite good defence review taking into account whole of government rather than, dare I say, cherry picking. Are we allowed to use that word nowadays? Um, the, in that time, since then, in the SSR field, we've always tried to sell, as it were, whole of government SSR. Quite often, though, we've been challenged as to, but Stephen, you don't do this in UK. As we have faded away from that integrated approach, 
I just wonder whether there are any questions that you have been asked like that by the people that you've worked with in, as a foreign diplomat um, that you've found difficult to answer because UK may have worked like that once, had best practice, but faded away from it. Okay, thank you. Who wants the first question on Christopher? You can't. Right. You're going to ask about that. Yeah, well, that last question wasn't directed at me, but I will, I will say that there has been talk in the past, of course, about foreign policy led strategic defence review. And in theory, you know, defence should be the, uh, a handmaiden of foreign policy, but it's not as simple as that, is it? There is a constant interplay between our understanding of ourselves in security and defence terms and the, the, the things that we want to do on the wider world stage. And, I hope that a more holistic approach can be taken, but it's bureaucratically and intellectually difficult. Spain, um, what message? It's a highly political business, isn't it? I suppose you know, our diplomats may want to be cautious about it, but you know, from my point of view, we need to uh, get on with Spain for the re exactly the reasons you've talked about, that we, have, we do have actually some important interests in the Mediterranean, given the demographic explosion, the instability in the Maghreb. You know, it, it was Britain and France that intervened, at least you know, primarily in Libya, uh, where the consequences are now extremely serious. Gibraltar, we haven't got the time to discuss, but it's, it's an issue which has to be, which can't be allowed to uh, run out of control. The interests of our citizens in Spain and yours here, of which there are many young, talented uh, people, are very, very uh, important, and the government should not forget them. As the question about the British Isles, a very interesting one. Um, I mean, it's impossible to imagine that if a country enters a phase in which its very unity is seriously in question, that this won't both have a drag effect on our ability to do other things and affect our image very seriously. Um, I mean, we saw what happened in, uh, uh, with, the, with the Catalans. Uh, you know, it spills over inevitably through transnational relations, through image politics, and... Uh, the United Kingdom, as many of us have understood living here, is a rather strange uh, uh, um, amalgam of different kinds of politics and, and traditions, but it's held together also rather remarkably. And one of the consequences of Brexit is inevitably that such strains as have been hidden for many years are now uh, emerging into the open. And if this is my last chance to say anything at all, I will say that the business of uh, of our image is inherently political. It can't just be dealt with by diplomats, however skilled. For example, you know, a, a Brexit, the impact of Brexit, that is, it's, it in, interacts with populism worldwide. It's been given a boost by it and gives a boost to it. Um, Salvini you know, said, from where I'm sitting, it's a beautiful lesson in democracy. And of course, other people think that. Whether Mr. Putin and Mr. Trump think it's a beautiful lesson of democracy or it's good for other reasons, I'm not sure. But there aren't many others who, who think that it's good for those reasons. Uh, uh, most people, I think, think are bewildered. Most people I talk to from other countries think, why the Brit Brits have shot themselves in the foot like this? Which they did by a rather narrow majority, but we did it. Um, and Sean, do you have any sort of final thoughts that could maybe address some of the questions? <laughs> I don't think I can give any um, particularly insightful answers on any of those. Um, I, I can answer the question over here with a very simple no. No, I've never been asked a question about this question about um, any reduction in our sort of integrated approach. Um, I'm afraid Spain is not my, my, my specialist topic. Um, you can see my name. Um, I'm half Scottish and I'm half Welsh. <laughs> so uh, um, I'll make one general point about sort of political debates um, and then I'll make a general point about soft power. On the political debate, um, one point that I can make and we did make through the, the, the referendum process, referendum debate, and one point that also we've made in, around the previous, um, you know, the, 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 the referendum that was held on, on Scottish independence is, you know, in many of the countries where we do point out that this is democracy in action. This is how democracy works, and sometimes it's messy, but this is how, this is how you know, you have robust institutions and you have dem democratic debate. Um, but on soft power, well, so I'm half Scottish and I'm half Welsh, um, and have an English husband. Um, I'm very happy to, 
take the best of all for soft power, and uh, I just hope that that will be the case uh, for many, many years to come. Menno, some final words from you. Yeah, very briefly. Um, so just on, on the union, I think the others have answered it very well. I mean, all I would say is that a diplomat, as diplomats, we've got a job to do to connect what we do with the citizens. And that's not just a union point, it's, it's a wider point as well. Um, and I think you know, we're thinking a lot about, you know, as part of the government's new domestic agenda, how can we tell a clearer story about what diplomacy does for people at home, um, whether they be in Scotland, Northern Ireland, Wales, or, or England. And um, that's something that I think we'll, we'll want to be doing uh, over the next few months as we go through the integrated review. Um, and actually, uh, just to share a sort of one sort of anecdote with you to think about in all of this is the two evacuation flights back from Wuhan in the last few days. One, because, you know, I think as, as others have kindly said, including Christopher, you know, diplomacy isn't an easy business. And, you know, we've got a few challenges at the moment and then coronavirus comes along and, you know, packs a bit of a, packs a, bit of a punch. And how we respond to that, um, I think, is, is challenging. But in terms of the efforts made in Wuhan to bring home not just British nationals, but also nationals from across the EU to work in incredibly closely with France and Germany and other nations to make sure that their people got on our plane and then got home safely, that gives me hope on all sorts of levels. Well, I think everyone can join me in thanking our panellists. Um, Professor Hill very succinctly expressed the, the concerns that a number of people have about the whole shooting in the foot um, dynamic of, of Brexit. Um, but equally, the two diplomats on either side of me really express that feeling across government and across Whitehall of a determination to make Brexit work. So, thank you very much.